When a prayer becomes a cry. When a prayer becomes a cry. Let's pray together, please, tonight. Father, I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the strength and power of your Holy Spirit that you choose to sovereignly give to those who love you and serve you, O God. Lord, I ask for a touch of your hand upon my physical body this night, O God. In my mind, Lord, that my thoughts will become your thoughts. Lord, that my ways will be your ways in this pulpit, O God. Lord Jesus, that every word that you want to speak to this assembly tonight would have free course through this earthen vessel, O God. Lord, help me to step out of the way and stand behind the cross, that you and you alone would be lifted up and heard and understood. Oh, Jesus, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy, O God. Thank you for your willingness to touch us every time we turn to your word, O God, and come to you with humble hearts and repentant, repentant minds, O God. Father, we just thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. When a prayer becomes a cry, Psalm 34 there's a certain type of a prayer I believe that God is looking for in his church today. I have spoken this message once before, and I believe only once. It was quite a, it was a few years ago. I don't remember the exact year, but it was a while back. But it has more relevance, I believe, today than the time that God first spoke it to my heart. When a prayer becomes a cry, it's something, it's a longing in the heart of God to have a people in this and every generation that will share his heart for this generation, and as our pastor has said tonight, that will long and yearn for the manifested glory and presence of Christ to come again, that his body would stand strong, that his name would be exonerated among the heathen, that he would be lifted up and held in the highest esteem. Psalm 34, it's a psalm of David when he changed, had to change his behavior before uh, Abimelech, who drove him away. I will bless the Lord at all times, Verse 1, his praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. Verse 6, this poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and he delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite or a crushed spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Psalm 34, verse 6, you see three times a key to what I believe made David in part a man after God's heart. We shared the other night that David was the king. He had a crown upon his head. David had armies. David had the wealth and power of nations at his disposal. David had everything and anything that most who are not uh, in tune with God would want in this or any other generation. But David had something in addition to this. David had an inward desire for, G for God, for, for the Lord. And he knew that without the Lord, he was absolutely nothing. He knew that if God forsook him, that didn't matter how big his crown was and how many armies he had, he had absolutely nothing without God. 
He refers to himself as a poor man in verse 6. He says, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Verse 17, the righteous cry, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. I want to talk tonight about when a prayer becomes a cry. A cry is simply this. It's when we get to the place where all hope of self-resolution of the problem is gone. All hope that we can deliver ourselves through some self-help program. All hope that our country can turn from its violence by putting more money into programs. All hope is gone. And God, at this time, is listening for the cry of his people. It's usually pride or self-dependence that will keep a people from crying out to the Lord. But in verse 18, the psalmist David says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. It is the prayer of John Knox standing up and yelling at the top of his voice, or perhaps from the very depths of his being or the top of his heart, Give me Scotland or I die. Every once in a while throughout history, every once in a while in a generation, there seems to be somebody that lays hold of the heart of God. Or perhaps it's just that God reveals his heart to a person or to a group of people in that generation. John Knox was one of those people who stood and in utter desperation said, God, give me Scotland or I die. And we know that through his life, many, many, many souls were saved and wonderful things were done for the kingdom of God. It was the prayer of a young man called Evan Roberts at the turn of the century who asked permission of his pastor to stand and share, I believe it was five things that God had shown him uh, that were necessary for a revival to come to a church. He shared his points that God had given him and then in utter despair he raised his voice to heaven and he cried out, bend us, bend us, right from the very depths of his being, bend us. And it is said in the biography that I read of Evan Roberts that it was like a sweeping wind of God's Spirit came upon that particular assembly and bent the people forward before God and began a move that within a, sh a short number of, uh, of months, over 225,000 people had come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. An incredible move of God's Spirit, a manifested presence of Christ in that generation comes or came on the heels of a prayer that was a cry before God. Now there are two, God, when I was preparing this message, had given me two different cries of a child. Now being a father, I don't necessarily feel that I'm overly in tune sometimes with the cries of children. But I know that my wife has been, and I, I, I noticed even visiting as a pastor over the years that ladies would, children be out in the yard and they'd be playing in the sandbox, and they'd begin fighting with one another, and a certain cry comes from them. It's kind of a whiny cry. And a lot of times God's people pray like that. They get down on their knees and they whine about their hydro bill, and they whine about their neighbors, and they whine about their church. It's a kind of a whiny cry that uh, most mothers just ignore. I might have thought something really bad was going on a couple of times, but... Moms just sit at the table and just absolutely ignore the cry. But then there's another cry that comes, and I, I often maybe have heard this but never picked up on it. It's a cry, it's a particular pitch in the voice. And I tell you, when a child is out in the yard and that particular cry comes from a child's voice, God help anybody that's standing between the, that child and his mother, I'll tell you right now. Like a mother bear coming out of the woods, heading out when her cubs give a certain kind of a cry. That's the kind of a cry that will get a mother's attention. In Psalm 18, just back a little bit in your Bibles, the psalmist David speaks of this particular cry. Psalm 18. I will love thee, verse 1, he says, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. The sorrows, verse 4, of death compassed me. The floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Verse 6, in my distress I called upon the Lord and what? Cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him even into his ears. Now we have to look tonight at the scene that's going on in heaven. The cherubim are standing up and they're worshiping God and the four and twenty elders are casting their thrones, their, their crowns before the throne of God and bowing down before Christ. 
and there's all kinds of activity in heaven, but all of a sudden a piercing cry comes from the earth. And I don't, I don't fully understand this. I know I've shared it with you before, but all of a sudden it seems like God says, hold it, and stops everything in heaven just for a moment. I just heard a cry. I just heard something that moves my heart. I just heard something that will move my hand. Somebody has come to the realization down there on earth that I am the answer to their prayer. Somebody has come to the realization that without me moving my hand, there is no hope of resolving this problem. Somebody has reached up and, and seemingly got through all the myriad of other types of prayers go through and they have come through and their prayer has become a cry and it has touched my very heart. It has come before my throne. Stop everything. There's something in the heart of God that will answer a prayer that becomes a cry. There's no hope in David. He says, the sores of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called out unto the Lord and I cried unto my God. Now that cry is not necessarily volume. People can misunderstand this, this aspect of prayer and say, well, and, and come to prayer meetings and say, well, okay, the louder I shout, the more God's going to hear it. No, that's not what it's all about. Sometimes a cry can be a groaning from within that you don't even speak. It's sharing the heart of God. It's the moving of the Holy Ghost within you. It's Christ revealing His heart. And in unison with Christ, you begin to pray with words that cannot not even be uttered. Yes, sometimes it might be volume. Yes, sometimes the Spirit of God might virtually overwhelm your physical body and you begin to cry hot tears and cry out to God. Other times it's a silence. It's a silent prayer down on your face before God that hardly anybody but you and God can hear. But still it's a cry. It's coming from the heart. It's got absolutely nothing to do with a manifestation. It's what's in your heart. It's how you're sharing the heart of God. He said, in my distress I called unto the Lord and I cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. My cry came before him even into his ears. And verse 7 says, Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. In other words, the anger of God was stirred. Somebody's messing around with David. Somebody's attacking the one that I love and loves me. Somebody's attacking a man that's after my own heart. And so everything begins to move. And verse 8 says, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. I find it hard to picture God with smoke coming out of his nostrils, but it's a, an indication in Scripture that there was a definite heating up in the heart of God. Somebody was messing around with one of his favorite children. He bowed the heavens and came down, and darkness was under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and did fly. Yea, he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret pavilion. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness that was before him, his thick clouds passed, hailstones and coals of fire. Verse 13, the Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. There's a whole lot of activity going on now in the spiritual realm. And why? Because one man, David, a man after God's heart, cried out unto the Lord cried out in his distress and said, God, I need you now. I need you to move like I never needed you before. I need your strength and your power. For your own holy name's sake, come and bring deliverance to those who need deliverance. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Verse 16 says, He drew from above. He took me and drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them which hated me, for they were too strong for me. Hallelujah. So he took him out of that place and delivered him from the power of his enemies. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to show you why God delivered David. I want to show you why God will answer certain prayers that come from the hearts of certain people. The effectual fervent prayer in the book of James says, of a righteous man availeth much. A righteous man, a man or woman who walked in a right relationship with God, a man or woman who walks in a repentive relationship with God is not cradling in their heart known sin, but they're walking in willful obedience to God because they love Him, because of what He has done through Jesus Christ. In verse 20 he says, The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. Now I want you to understand this. If you've got dirty hands, don't come into the presence of God and begin to cry out anything. Your, your prayers are going to not be heard. They're not going to be answered. It's a waste of time to pray if you have willfully dirty hands. If God has spoken to you about something that's sin in your life and you're not willing to deal with it, your prayers will not be effectual. They will not be fervent and they will not avail very much in the kingdom of God. 
Verse 21, David says, For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore hath the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness and according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyesight. Hallelujah. Now listen to what else God did for David. Look at verse 36. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. Now this is the end of the same psalm where David is crying out and saying, The sores of hell are all around me. Wicked men have made me afraid. I'm in such distress that I've got to cry out to the Lord. Now listen to what God has done. Verse 37, I have pursued mine enemies and overtaken them, neither did I turn again until they were consumed. I have wounded them that they were not able to rise. They have fallen under my feet. David, God not only delivered David, but gave David the strength to turn and face his enemies and in the strength and power of Christ to defeat everything and everyone that had risen up against him. For thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. Thou hast subdued unto me those that rose up against me. Thou hast given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. They cried. There's a cry that God will not hear. They cried, but there was none to save them. You see, their hands were not clean, and their plans were not pure, and their righteousness was found to be hateful before God. Even unto the Lord they cried, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them small as the dust before the wind and cast them out as dirt in the streets. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We pray corporately and individually for freedom. We pray for holiness. We pray for the manifested glory of God both in our own lives and throughout the church and throughout the nation. But until we come to the point of understanding that we cannot make one hair white or black, that we can't make ourselves one inch taller or shorter as the Scriptures testifies. Until our prayers become clothed in a complete dependence upon God, we will never know the miracle of His merciful touch. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Look at the book of Matthew, please. I'm going to show you examples of this. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. <clears throat> A woman comes to Jesus with her daughter. I want to show you what kind of a prayer she prayed and how God responded to that prayer. Matthew 15, 22. And behold, a woman out of Canaan came out of the same coast and what? And cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My, son is, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth. There was something in the heart of this mother for her daughter. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's tables. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it even unto thee, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. This woman was not willing to let go. There was something in her heart. Her daughter was grievously vexed. And she knew that Jesus, the Son of God, was the one who could touch her and set her free. And even though the disciples tried to push her away and perhaps the crowd tried to stop her, and even though Jesus didn't respond to her the first time she cried, she was not willing to let go because she knew that he was the answer that she needed. And he was the one that could set her, dog, her daughter free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go to Mark chapter 9, please. Mark chapter 9. A father came to Christ with his son. Mark chapter 9, a father with his demon-possessed boy. And oft times it has cast him into the fire, he says, and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child, what? Cried out. And said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. I believe, O oh God, as much as I can. And if I'm missing anything anywhere, you've got to help me. You've got to help me. I believe. 
When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Hallelujah. We see a mother crying out for her demon-possessed daughter. We see a father crying out for his demon-afflicted son. And I want to ask you a question of Times Square Church in New York. Can we cry out this week? Can we cry out this night? Can we cry out starting in this week of being set apart for prayer and fasting? Can we cry out once again for our demon-possessed children in North America? Those that have no hope without God. Can we cry out for them one more time? There's a certain thing that God is looking for in our prayers. An absolute acknowledgement. Jesus, it's gone too far. There's absolutely no hope unless you intervene. I'm not going to turn away. I shall not be denied this thing. I believe that you're a loving God. I believe you're a merciful God. Father, you sent your son to pay a horrible price that every one of these children might be able to be standing and clothed and in their right minds, giving honor and glory to your name, that your name would be lifted up and glorified in this last hour of time. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord is looking for a cry from the hearts of his people because it's in his heart. He sees these children out on the streets. He sees their hopeless condition. He sees the lostness. He sees their, their absolute despair and their thinking daily perhaps of taking their own lives. And it's in his heart to see them set free. It's in his heart to redeem them. That's why God the Father sent his son. That's why Jesus didn't turn his back on us in Gethsemane. That's why he went all the way to Calvary. There's a cry in the heart of God to save and redeem and sanctify. And he waits for somebody to share that cry. He waits for somebody that will touch his heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I could stop right there. I could stop right there this night. We've got so many demon-possessed and afflicted children in North America now. God is yearning for people to touch his heart so that he can show himself strong for his own holy name's sake. Psalm 120, please. We pray for personal holiness in the church. How many here have prayed for holiness but are having a hard time laying hold of it? I appreciate your honesty tonight. Psalm 120, verse 1 says, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Oh God, there's a certain cry that comes before God's Spirit begins to move in your life. It's a cry that is birthed with an absolute understanding that only Christ can perfect holiness within us. We can't make ourselves holy. We can't crucify our own flesh. But we can surrender to the one who can. We can give him our lives in entirety and say, oh Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I desire that you be magnified in my life. I desire that your, your presence be in my life. I desire that people would be able to look upon my life and see you and see you high and lifted up and be drawn unto you because of your working within my life. I desire personal holiness. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Deliver me, O God, from having a heart that is double-minded and unstable in all its ways. Deliver me, O God, from having one foot in the world and the other one in your kingdom. Lord Jesus, plant within this earthen vessel, O God, the fire of devotion for you that will cause these other things to pale in comparison to wanting you and loving you and living for you. In my distress I cried unto the Lord, the psalmist says. And that's a cry that God is looking for in his people in this hour of time. A cry for personal holiness. A cry to be truly uh, representatives of Christ here on this earth. A, a cry to have a burning love and desire for Jesus Christ that we can truly be a city that's set upon a hill in this last hour of time that cannot be hidden from those that are lost. That's the cry that Christ is looking for in his church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. We cry for freedom from bondage. So many people, even in God's house, are in bondage. But listen to David in Psalm 141. 
Lord, he says, I cry unto thee. Make haste unto me. Give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense. Oh, I'm in the wrong psalm, but it's a good one anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. Hallelujah. Listen, you've got to understand tonight, folks, I've been more up in the air in the last two months than I've been on the ground. <laughs> Hallelujah. Finally, I'm landed. And it's just taken my mind a little while to catch up with the rest of my body. Psalm 142, a prayer of David when he was in the cave. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I, I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I, have, I walked, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, and there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed for me. No man cared for my soul. I, what does it say in verse 5? I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. If you're in bondage tonight, if your life, if there's something the enemy's got hanging over your head, I challenge you with all of my heart to cry out unto the Lord and to cry out to him who's merciful and who will deliver you and set you free from all captivity and bondage. Let die all of your own plans and schemes to bring freedom to your own life. And give it once and for all to Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our salvation. Peter was a man who was afraid of serving God. And you remember the story when Jesus came to the boat and he said to Peter, step out of the boat and step on the water and come to me. And Peter said, Lord, I was, I was remarked that, marveled at Peter's uh, responses. Lord, if it's you, <laughs> I will, bid me come. Well, who else do you think it would be standing out in the water? Don't you love it? Don't you love it, the fact that Jesus really chose human vessels, just like you and me, full of frailties and faults, and yet he used them so mightily because they have a certain quality about them. And in Matthew 14, 30, it says that Peter stepped out of the boat, he walked on the water, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And in verse 31 it says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. Immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand. If you're afraid of serving the Lord, afraid of stepping out of the boat of comfortable living, uh, just step out anyway. And if the waves begin to surround you and difficulties come upon your life, cry out unto the Lord. And I guarantee you that immediately Jesus will reach out his hand and grab your hand. If it's in your heart to glorify his holy name and to live for him. That's what was in Peter's heart. He wanted to live for God. But Jesus knew that there were things that needed to be done in his life. Hallelujah. Look at the book of Jonah, please. Go ahead to Jonah. Isn't it wonderful to find gems and treasures out of the word of God? The book of Jonah challenges us to never underestimate the mercy of God when souls cry out to him in repentance. Jonah, first of all, is in his own personal nightmare because he has run away from the commission of the Lord to go to Nineveh, a wicked city, and preach the gospel to that city. And Jonah goes the other way. You know the story. And those that are new in the Lord, he got into a ship heading the other way. A tremendous storm came up. The, the other sailors realized he was the cause of the storm. They threw him overboard, and a whale swallowed him. Jonah was in big, big trouble. And in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly, and said, <clears throat> in verse 2, I what? I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he, he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. There was absolutely no hope that Jonah was going to resolve this thing in his own strength. He was in the belly of a whale. <laughs> Hallelujah. He was in a bad place. And that's the time to cry out to the Lord. And so God sent deliverance to Jonah. In verse 10, uh, chapter 2, it says, The Lord spake to the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. And in chapter 3, verse 4, 
Jonah goes into Nineveh, and it says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth, even from the greatest of them unto the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. And what was the king's commandment? And cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And verse 10 says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. We must never, ever underestimate the mercy of God. His mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Nineveh cries mightily unto God and God turns at least for a season from the thing that he said he was going to do. Now look at the response of Jonah. Chapter 4, it says, And it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because God had changed his mind. And in verse 2, he says, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. He says, when you called me to go to Nineveh, Lord, that's why I went the other way, because I know what kind of a God you are. I know that you were going to call me, and I was going to go through this wicked city, and I was going to proclaim the coming judgment of God, and they were going to rep and if they repented and, and, and uh, turned to sackcloth and ashes and turned from their evil way, that you would forgive them all, and I would end up sitting on a hill looking like a fool. That's why I didn't want to go, because I know you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now go back to Psalm 22, please. Psalm 22. I want to speak to you about God's faithfulness when you cry out to Him. God is faithful. God is merciful. He will touch our country. He will touch our children. He will touch our lives. He will touch our churches. He's faithful for His own namesake if He can find a people that will cry out to Him in this hour of time. That's why it's on Pastor Wilkerson's heart to call the church to prayer. God is looking for a people that will touch his heart. A people who will come before him in sincerity and in truth and cry out to the Lord in this hour of crisis. It's a desperate hour and it requires desperate measures. It requires a desperate people crying out to God in desperation saying, Lord, look at our situation. If there's anything in our hands that's not right, O oh God, if there's anything in my life, Lord, cleanse me, purify me, reveal to me by the Holy Ghost that I may lay these things down, that my prayers may once again touch your heart. Oh God, I ask for your own holy namesake that you touch our city, that you touch our streets, that the manifested glory of Christ literally pour like an oil, a healing oil in our streets, that thousands upon thousands come to the saving knowledge of Christ and stand up clothed and in their right minds for the honor of your name. Hallelujah. Psalm 20, 22, verse 4. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. Verse 5. They... They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. Verse 24, For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither has he hid his face from him. But when he cried, he heard. Go ahead to Psalm 30. Psalm 30. Let's read it together, verses 1 to 3. I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. 
Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. If you're feeling overwhelmed tonight, if your enemies are coming against you, cry out unto the Lord. He says, O Lord my God, I cried unto thee, and thou hast healed me. Verse 7, please. Verse 7. Let's read it together to verse 12. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood? When I go down to the pit, shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Hallelujah. 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 Psalm 31, verse 22. For I said in my haste, I am cut off before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardst the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. You know, the Lord even helps the hasty. He does. Has anybody here ever said that? Oh God, I'm cut off before your eyes. I've gone too far this time. I've done too much. I said in my haste, I'm cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplication when I cried unto you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Psalm 107. Turn there, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Yes, I hear that voice. Hallelujah. <laughs> we'll read right through together from verse 2 to 32. How's that sound? Let the Word of God speak. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, and from the north, and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. They found no city to dwell in. Think about yourself before you came to Christ. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of all their distresses. He led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city of habitation. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfieth the longing soul and filleth the hungry soul with goodness. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and brake their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of brass, and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Fools, because of their transgression, and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near unto the gates of death. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, and for his wonderful works to the children of men. And let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. 
Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he brings them unto their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Hallelujah. 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 Would you stand, please? Now, I have a, just a word before I give this altar call. And I'm going to read it to you from the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 7. And it said, The Lord appeared to Solomon by night, and he said unto him, I have heard thy prayer, and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there be no rain. When I ask you a question tonight, is heaven shut up to much of North America in this generation? Is there no rain? Now we're talking about the rain of God's Holy Spirit presence and power of Christ being manifested throughout the land. If I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And verse 15 and 16 are the verses that God tucked away in my heart this morning as I was pondering this message. Now mine eyes shall be open, and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. The Lord has brought you here to this place, every one of us. He is sanctified, He is cleansed, He is delivered, and we have seen and known the goodness of God. Isn't that so? All I have to do is look at so many of you and look at your faces and see you worship God and hear your testimonies to know that God has been good to the people in this house, to every one of us. And he says, I brought you into this place and I prepared this house for myself to be known as a house of sacrifice. And when the land has no rain and the locusts are devouring the people and there are pestilence going throughout the nation, he says, now my eyes will be open and my ears listening for the prayer that will be made in this place. I've chosen to sanctify this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. God is saying to my heart, I have prepared a people to share my heart in this last hour of time. And I'm looking for a different kind of prayer from this people. Not just people who come and spend seven days or seven years or seven weeks or whatever it will be to pray for themselves and their own needs. But a people who will reach out and once they know that they're free and once they know that they're walking in right relationship will have a different kind of prayer. They will share the very heart of my son. God so loved the world. You see, this cry was in the heart of God. It was in the, I believe it was in the heart of God right in Gethsemane when he came down and called out to Adam and Adam wasn't there anymore. He had hidden himself. I believe a cry came into the heart of God. My children, my heritage, my creation, my sons, my daughters. And that cry has always been in the heart of God. And somehow, some way, I don't fully understand it, but it seems that God has tied the moving in of his hand time and again to the prayers of his children. I don't fully understand that. I know that God can move sovereignly in spite of us. But there's a longing in his heart to share the things that he yearns and longs and in some cases is already destined to do. To share it with us that we may cry out unto him and rejoice with joy that is exceeding beyond anything this world can ever offer when we see the hand of God moving and delivering and saving those who without Christ are absolutely without hope. 
This city is without hope, without Christ. You could pour a hundred billion dollars into this city alone, and it will not cure the problems of this city. There's a spiritual problem in this city that people are without God. And you can pacify it and you can buy it only for a season, but it will continue to get worse and worse. Father, would you help us tonight? Would you help us to share your heart for this generation? Would you help us to be able to cry out, O oh God, for our sons and daughters, your sons and daughters, O oh Lord, that you love and care for so many out in the streets without hope, without life, without Christ. Lord, you yearn for them. You love them, Lord Jesus. You're sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession this very moment. Lord God, help us to step out of all carnality. Help us to step out of the foolishness of caring only about ourselves and thinking about ourselves. And help us, oh God, to understand your mission. Help us to understand your heart. Help us to understand why you did what you did in sending your son. Help us to understand Calvary. Help us to understand the tomb. Help us to understand, oh God, what you did on Calvary, oh God, and what was accomplished when you rose from the dead. Help us to understand, oh God, the warfare that we're in and the yearning that's in your heart to see your sons and daughters released again into the glorious freedom and liberty of Christ. Help us to understand your mercy that you long to pour out on this generation as you have in times gone by, like in the days of Nineveh, O oh God. For a season, Lord God, pour out your mercy before your wrath, O oh God. In wrath, I ask this night, O oh Lord, remember mercy. In wrath, remember, O oh God, that you paid a tremendous and terrible price so that all who call out upon your name may be saved. Help us as your church body, Lord Jesus, to step out of our own selves, to step out of our own needs, our own desires, our own comforts, being concerned about our own selves, oh God. Help us, oh God, to cry out for our children, oh Lord. Help us, Lord Jesus, to cry out for the city and the nations, oh God. Oh Lord Jesus, may we be known in this last hour of time as a people who touch your heart, oh God, and who see your hand move, and who see the manifested glory of Christ, not only upon our lives, but upon all who call upon the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Lamb of God. Hallelujah. I praise your holy name tonight, O oh God. I praise your holy name. I bless your holy name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh God, everybody who's in this audience tonight who could say that I want my prayer to become a cry. I don't, you know, that it takes honesty. There was a blind man that came to Jesus and he said, what would, I, what would you like me to do? And he said, I'd like to receive my sight. And so he prayed for him. And he said, how, how do you see now? He said, I see men as trees walking. That man couldn't see and neither yet was he blind. He sort of was half seeing. And there are people here, I'm going to be honest with you tonight. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you're more moved by the sight of a pretty tree in the fall than you are by the sight of a lost soul walking down the streets when you leave this church. You're moved by trees, but you're not yet moved by the plight of fallen man. You need to be at this altar and say, God, I don't want to be a blind man, half, half seeing, moved by trees, but not moved by the souls of men. Oh God, touch my heart tonight. Touch my life tonight. I want my prayer to become a cry. Lord Jesus, I want there to be a change in my prayer life. I want there to be a depth come into my heart that can only come from your throne. I want to pray, as the scripture says, with those groanings that cannot be uttered. I want to know what it's like to be burdened. I want to be an intercessor for this generation. I want to walk a righteous walk, God. I want to have an open, holy life that you can speak to any time about anything, any issue in my heart that's not right before you, God, that you can put your finger on it and say, sin, and I will not resist you, O oh God. I will repent and turn from it that my prayers can continue to touch your heart. If that's your cry tonight, please just step out of your seat right now and come to this altar and we're going to pray together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is looking for a people. God is looking for a people that will just share his heart. To share his heart. Hallelujah. Just come, make lots of room at the front. Press in tight to the front because a lot of people are coming. You realize what you're asking God for tonight? You can leave this altar and it may never be the same again. Hallelujah. Just keep coming.
We're living at the very threshold of eternity now. And I think you would agree with me tonight, we need a miracle. We need a miracle for these children that are all around us, these people that need God, sons and daughters, those that are afraid of serving God. We need a desire for holiness in the house of the Lord. I know that many of you have that. It's evident by your response to God. But don't ever cease to cry out for that. Don't ever cease to say, Jesus, make me holy. Not legalistically holy, but holy out of relationship. Just because I love you, Lord God. Just because I want you, I yearn for you. Let there be holiness in my life. Let me walk in obedience to you. Hallelujah. Just begin to pray now. Just begin to lift up your hearts before the Lord. Say, Lord Jesus, touch my life. Touch my life, Lord Jesus. Touch my life, Lord Jesus. Let my prayer become a cry. Let my prayer become a cry. Let there be a groaning, O oh God, in my inward man. Deliver me from caring only about myself and help me to care about others that are around me, O oh Lord God. O oh Jesus, we yearn and long for a move of your spirit. We long, God, to see sons and daughters packing not only this house, but your church all throughout the city of New York, all throughout, Lord God, this area, that there would be a true move of the Spirit of Almighty God, that, Jesus, you would be manifested, Lord, in your church and through your people, O oh God. Thank you for this right now. Lord, I ask that your young people, Lord, could come into your house in the coming days and not see foolishness and not see carnality, but see the living God moving through his children through his church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I ask that they would be drawn by the holiness of Christ, that they would be drawn by the very nature and working of Christ in his church uh, through his body. Hallelujah, precious Holy Lamb of God. Precious Holy Lamb of God. We cry out for the moving of your spirit. We cry out for the touch of your hand. We cry out for our city, O oh God. O oh Lord, give a, an anointing of repentance. Let it come upon government leaders, Lord, in this country. Oh, Lord God, may they acknowledge that all of their attempts uh, to turn the nation back again, that our birth of the Spirit will come to nothing. Let them acknowledge that they have sinned. Oh, God, give them the grace to repent. Give them the grace uh, to gird their hearts and lives in sackcloth and ashes and cry out to the Lord for mercy before you send judgment upon this nation. Oh, God, let there be a mighty, mighty overflowing of the love and mercy of Christ. Oh, God, saving hundreds of thousands thousands all over, oh God, glorifying your house before judgment comes, glorifying your name for your own holy name's sake, Lord God. We ask you to bring down the walls of falsehood in your house. Bring down the pride of man, oh God. Bring down self-assertion, Lord Jesus. Bring down all of the carnal attempts to manufacture your spirit. God, bring it all down. Bring it all down. Lay it low. Lay it level in the dust. And let there be a genuine, a genuine, a genuine manifestation of Jesus. Jesus Christ in this last hour of time. Father, I ask for your own holy name's sake that you would do this in your house. Do this among your people, oh God, for your own holy name's sake, Lord God. Move, Lord, move. Uh, yea, oh God, oh spare your people, Lord, spare your people. Let not the heathen rule over your house. Let not your name be brought under reproach any longer, oh God. Oh Lord Jesus, move in power in our streets. Move in power in your house, oh God. Touch and sanctify. Set apart, O oh God. Hallelujah, Lamb of God. Hallelujah, precious, holy Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. I ask tonight, Father, that you would touch the lives of all who have gathered at this altar tonight. Touch every soul, every man, every woman, every young person, every young man, every young lady. Touch their lives, O oh God, with the anointing of your Holy Spirit. Allow us, O oh God, to share your heart for this generation. Allow us to share your burden. Let our prayer become a cry, touching your throne once again, causing you to stand up in anger, causing you to come down, O oh God, and scatter the enemies of righteousness, Lord. Hallelujah. We cry out tonight, O oh God, that you would release our sons and daughters in this city from the bondage of hell and darkness and let them see once again the glorious risen Christ. Let them understand the mercy, O oh God, that you have provided through Christ. Hallelujah. Father, thank you tonight, O oh God. Thank you for touching the people at this altar, O oh God. Thank you for touching the people in this sanctuary who yearn and long, Jesus, 
to cry out in your holy name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.